We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 1. <clears throat> As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. <clears throat> there is one body. In one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. And God, as we just come to this time of studying your word, we just pray that you give us wisdom, guidance, and direction, and help us to understand your word a little bit better. We just pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> this week, a lot of people give attention to, to Halloween. And, and to try to preach on something Halloween usually means it's something negative. I don't want to preach on something negative. I want to preach on something positive. One of the other things that most Christians don't realize is that October 31st is also Reformation Day, where the church is remembering what happened in history and how people in history impacted the church. Well, as part of this, I want us to go back and think about things that sometimes we in the Christian church, Church of Christ, don't talk enough about, and that is our actual history. The Restoration Movement is a couple hundred years old. And one of the most important documents, one of the founding documents of the Restoration Movement, and one that many people even say actually began it, was the Declaration and Address by Thomas Campbell. Now, I'm not going to read that to you today, and if you've ever seen it, you're going to be glad, because it's very, very long. Instead, I'm going to just talk about some of the highlights. Thomas Campbell was the father of Alexander Campbell, and Alexander Campbell was really the guy that, that was really a big part of the movement. But Thomas Campbell's Declaration and Address set forth some principles from Scripture that the Christian churches and churches of Christ have focused on over the past couple hundred years. I want to talk just about some of the themes that he discussed in there. I want to compare it to Scripture because even though I believe it is a very biblically based document, it doesn't mean that it's perfect. And we need to compare all teachers, no matter who they are, with what the Scripture actually says. So we're going to take a look at it tonight. The statements and the attitudes of the Declaration and Address are just as relevant to the church today as it was when it was first written. What's in a document? First of all, I want us to notice that he talked about there being one church. Thomas Campbell was dismayed at the sight of a, dis a divided church. Now, we have a divided church today. We'll talk about that in a minute. But when you go back a couple hundred years ago, there was a real problem within Christianity. In fact, I'm going to butcher this because I didn't write it down. So I'm going to try to, to say it. You had the new light anti-burger Presbyterian church. You had the old light anti-burger Presbyterian church. And they were at odds with each other. And when you had these two groups, and there was a lot of silliness within some of these denominations, you couldn't even go to another Presbyterian church if you wasn't a part of that and have communion with them. If you didn't have the right credentials, the right token, the right, um, well, the right church group, you were denied some of the basic things in Christianity. And as Thomas Campbell is looking at this, he's like, this is not what Christ intended. This is not what the church intended. So as he wrote this document, he wanted to make sure and declare that there was only one church. That the, the fractions and the denominations that we had today were never intended by God. And were therefore sinful and evil. And see, we can go back and we can compare what Christ says about this. Jesus Christ's prayer was for Christians to be united in this world. When you look at John chapter 17, you look at verses 20 through 23, we see how Jesus prayed right before he went to the cross for the church to be united. 
John chapter 17, starting with verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. What an impactful thing. Just in a few hours, Jesus Christ is going to be nailed to the cross. And Jesus is on the cross for our sins. And he is dying for the church. And his request, as it is recorded by the disciple whom he loved, is for the church to be united. Not to have these divisions. Not to have all these factions inside of Christianity. Some of which are extremely ridiculous. That we cannot be united based upon the one we call Lord. We call Jesus Lord. And this is his request. And the church cannot follow this simple request. And this is part of what the restoration plea has been to come back to. You see, our goal should be to be unified with as many Christians as possible. To call out into the light, let's join together. Let's be a united front against the attacks of Satan in this world. By the way, why did Jesus say he wanted us to be united? So that the world may believe. And you know what? Even today, some people who are non-believers say that they don't believe the message is because there are so many churches and so many groups and we can't agree on anything. How can we have the truth? If for nothing else, we should want to be united so that people would not die in their sins and go to hell. But there becomes the issue. Can we make a great plea? We want to be united. But united in what? Well, Campbell had a phrase for that. Campbell said that our union is found in the truth of God's word. Union in truth. In other words, what he says is, is we have to go back to the Word and to the Word alone to find what unites us. You see, here's the problem. Even though we are one to have unity with all people, we cannot have union with people who willfully, intentionally abuse or change the Scriptures. This is where it becomes very difficult of putting this into practice. When we look at the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, the apostle Paul talked about people who changed the word. Galatians, chapter 1, starting with verse 6 through 9. And as though I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Just really no gospel at all. Evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach you, let him be eternally condemned. As you have already said, so now I say again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. When Paul was writing this, here was the basic problem. We had a group of Christians who were going around telling everyone that the Gentile Christians had to be circumcised and obedient to the law before they could become a Christian. <coughs> now again, just be very simplistic. How difficult would it be to win converts when you're telling all the men you've got to be circumcised before you become a Christian? Because in the Gentile world, that was a disgusting thing. To the Gentile world, that was an offensive thing. And it was a stumbling block to them. And when we go back into the, old, or when we go back into the book of Acts, we see 
that this was never anything that Christ had intended. This was somebody who was adding to the commandments of Christ when it came to the plan of salvation. And Paul spends a great part of the New Testament arguing, debating, and even cutting fellowship at times with people who changed the gospel. <coughs> and that's where we sometimes differ. We have a stopping point. We say, if you are going to deny the very basics of Christianity, we can't have fellowship with false doctrine. But it gets tricky. You see, what happens often is what we're debating is not really the truth of the gospel, but our opinions about the gospel. See, we need to know the difference between the truth of the gospel and our opinions and traditions. Traditions here are something that Jesus used as a term. During the gospel era, the Pharisees, and, well, the Pharisees in particular, a lot of the religious leaders, had the Old Testament, then they had the oral Torah. Now what it was was a, a list of teachings that were outside of Scripture that they applied equally to Scripture or even sometimes above Scripture. And Jesus was at constant odds with them because the Pharisees' interpretation was often bad because they weren't reading from the Scriptures. They weren't making an observation from Scripture. They were taking their traditions, they were taking their opinions and making it equally binding as the scriptures. One, one such example is in Matthew chapter 15. In Matthew chapter 15, <clears throat> verses 1 through 9, Jesus Christ deals with this. Matthew chapter 15, starting with verse 1. And some Pharisees and teachers of law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. <clears throat> Jesus replied, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me, is a gift devoted to God. He is not to honor his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your traditions, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are about rules taught by men. What we see here happens in religion even to this day. We have clear-cut scriptural passages that tells us clear-cut scriptural things. For instance, I believe it's very clear cut that the scripture talks about the fact that you have to repent and be baptized for forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's scripture. But then there's other things where we have some freedom. For instance, the Bible talks about the fact that we are to teach. We are to be a teaching congregation. Now, but it doesn't always say what avenue that is. For some congregations, such as ours, we have a Sunday school period. For some people, they do a small group period, or a cell group period, or they do, a, they do a lot of other things. Some get very creative with it. And with some people, you say, well, you don't have Sunday school, well, you're not a real church. Really, can you prove that to me in Scripture? Sunday school is, in Christian history, a relatively new thing. It's about two, between two to three hundred years old. The original. The church in Acts didn't have Sunday school. Or at least it's not recorded. So what we do is we take what our tradition is, what our opinion is, and say, well, if you don't follow my interpretation of Scripture, we can't have fellowship. And what Campbell was saying in his document, it's something that Jesus is trying to emphasize here, is you can't take an opinion. You cannot take a tradition or you cannot take your freedom in Christ and say that this is a matter of fellowship. In other words, what we have to do is every congregation has to do this. Every single Christian has to do this. Sit down and tell the difference. What does the scripture say? What is my opinion? 
You know, sometimes we make it over silly stuff. You know, sometimes we have a debate about how the preacher should dress. Do I have to be in a suit and tie up here to be biblical? Because if so, we got a problem because they didn't have suits back in the Apostles' day. See, this is an opinion. Scripturally speaking, we're to be here and we're to be to, to sharing the Word, be studying in the Word, we're to be studying in song, we're to be taking up of the Lord's offering, we're to be taking around the Lord's communion, we are to be having fellowship with one another. Some of the mechanics of how we do it is an opinion. It's never a test of fellowship. See, this is what happens and we have a weaker and a stronger brother. When we disagree about our opinions, we need to show each other grace. God gives us all grace. And he expects us, as Christians, to show others grace. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians... You know, because I'm kind of one of these weird creatures. It's either to become one of my favorite books of the Bible. Now, when you look at it, you, you kind of ask, why? Are you, are you like mental or something? Because the church in Corinth was one huge mess. They disagreed. They fought. They had all kinds of problems. I like going back to 1 Corinthians because whenever <laughs> I start feeling sorry for myself in the, in the ministry, I go back and look at 1 Corinthians and say, it's really not that bad. It could be a whole lot worse. And here's one of those instances. Now about food, sacrifice to idols. We know that all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something, but does not yet know, as he ought to know. The man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food, sacrifice to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods, many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come, and from whom all and from whom we live. There is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things come, and through whom we believe. But not everyone knows this. Some people who are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol since their conscience is weak. It is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, no better if we do. Be careful, however. The exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to an idol? So this weaker, weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brother in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again. So that will not cause him to fall. Basically, here is Paul's point. See, this is some of the things I'm glad I don't have to deal with anymore. When they wanted a good steak, they went to the temple because that's where the good meat was. Well, some people say, well, that steak was sacrificed to an idol. I can't eat it. Others like, it's a steak, pasta, one sauce, I'm eating it. And it was a real debate. Because for the weak Christian, he's looking at this and it's like, is eating that steak worshiping an idol? And if it's worshiping an idol, can I worship both God and an idol like we do with all the other religions? Because in the Roman Empire, you worship one God, you can worship all the other ones too. It was Christianity and Judaism at first that said, no, there's only one God, and you can't worship all these other gods. So it became a real problem. And Paul's like, guys, it's a steak. If you're worried about it, don't ask where it came from which is always a good principle when you go to somebody's house and eat or go to a restaurant. You just don't ask, right? right. Because it's just don't ask. But if they tell you this has been offered to an idol, even though you have the freedom <coughs> to eat it, say, I'm going to abstain, I'll eat some vegetables. Because 
your job as a mature Christian is to look out for the weak Christian. So in matters of opinion, in matters of freedom, in matters of tradition, you look out for your brother. And you don't make it an issue. What happens in Christianity, to tell you this confidently, we will fight more over our traditions than we ever will our scriptures. That's the truth. We will fight more over our traditions or rituals, if you will, than we ever will scripture. When I did my research on church splits, very few of the splits was actually over doctrine. It wasn't a heavy issue. It was our opinions that divided. Know the difference between Scripture and opinion. In Scriptures, you stand strong and you try to bring your brother or sister into your opinion, into, into the truth of the Scripture. If it's a matter of opinion, just have grace. It's not worth arguing over. And you think about somebody else more than yourself. Well, what part of Scripture today is authoritative for us? In other words, we're talking about how Scripture is authoritative and we need to, to stick to Scripture. Campbell did this. In his document, Campbell made a distinction between the Old and New Testament. What he's basically saying is that all Scripture is equally God-breathed and is, has equal revelation, which matches what the Scripture says. When the Apostle Paul talked about this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Hi. Verses 16 through 17. All Scripture is God breathed. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. But what Campbell says is even though this statement with 2 Timothy is true, the Old Testament was for the Old Testament Jewish people, it was this particular set of laws that helped bring the people to God under that system. And as we come into the New Testament, the New Testament is for the Christians. It is our guide. It is our instruction manual for the Scriptures. Well, what does the Bible as a whole say about this? Christians are not bound by all of the Old Testament commandments. Sometimes this gets us called hypocrites because of this. See, here's what you can understand. There's different types of laws in the Old Testament. There's the moral law. The moral law is actually established before the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law starts in the book of Exodus. When we go into the book of Genesis, we see some things that is moral or immoral in the book of Genesis that is moral and immoral under the Old Testament law and that is immoral or immoral in the New Testament period. It doesn't change. That stays consistent. However, in the Old Testament, we also see a civil law that dealt with how Israel is to be their, their, their system of government. We see a religious law that dealt with how Israel was to worship God and how they were to have their sins covered over until the time of Jesus Christ. We also see a ceremonial law which deals with the cleanliness of the people. The moral law is consistent. The civil, the religious, the <coughs> ceremonial law was for a particular time period. You may ask, well, how do you know this? Well, first of all, look what Jesus says. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus very clearly says what's going to happen with the law. Here he says this. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Law or the prophets here is what the Jewish people called the Old Testament, even what the Jewish people still call the Old Testament today. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. That is, everything that the Old Testament law was teaching, everything that the Old Testament prophets were preaching, was pointing straight to Jesus Christ. And when he came, he was the fulfillment of all those things. Now the apostles also dealt with this issue as well in the book of Acts chapter 15. In the book of Acts chapter 15, we start with verse 5.
that some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So what we're dealing here with is a group of Christians who says all Gentiles must be obedient to the Old Testament law. All of them. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that for some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed and he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Those simply became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul tell about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophet are in agreement with this as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. The remnant of men may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things that have been known for the ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to the Lord. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat, strangled, the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Here's what the apostles came to the conclusion of. God did not require the Gentiles to keep the Old Testament faith. Because the Old Testament faith was for a time period of the Jewish people. But when Christ came, there was a change. And that change now is to be obedient to the apostles' teachings as it is recorded in the New Testament. That's why we call ourselves a New Testament church. <laughs> that is our guiding document of faith. <laughs> We need to understand how the Bible is put together and how to read it for our faith. Well, here's what I'm saying is most people don't understand how the Bible is placed together. I don't mean that as an insult. I don't mean that as something that means people are stupid. I'm just saying the church doesn't do a good job of it. For example, most the average person who opens up a car and looks at the motor, can they tell how each individual part fits together to make the motor run? A lot of people can't. They know that you turn the engine, or you turn the key. If you can turn the engine, you're, you're a pretty good person. You turn the key, the engine comes on. And all the parts are working like they should, but they don't know how they fit together. Here's what I'm saying is most people don't understand the difference between the Old and New Testament. They don't understand how God put together the Bible in such a way so that we can understand it clearly. They don't understand the differences in the books of the various Bibles. They don't understand the authority that God has placed throughout the New Testament. Because of this lack of teaching on the church's part, there's a lot of people who are in ignorance of the Scriptures. That is our fault. And we need to get back to the point where we're teaching people what the Bible actually is, how it's put together, how to properly understand it, so people understand their faith. Today we talked a lot about Campbell and what happened in the past. Campbell's been dead for an awful long time. And though I think that he and his son were great men, they still need to be compared and examined by the Scriptures. While it's good for us to honor the past, to study the past, and study history, it is equally, if not more important, to examine all their teachings with what the Bible actually says. So today one of the things I want to encourage the church is, yes, study your history. Know where you came from. Know why you came from that particular teaching. More importantly, don't trust just any man, no matter who they are. You study the Word for yourself 
And you compare all teachings in this world to what the scripture says to make sure that the preacher, that the teacher, that the religious leader is teaching you the truth and not leading you astray. Speaking of leading astray, a lot of people are going astray and their life is going straight to hell and they don't know it. If you have not believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, if you have not confessed Him as your Lord and Savior, if you have not repented of your sins, and if you have not been baptized for forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, you are in danger. But you have an opportunity today to change that as we stand and sing our invitation on the hymn song.